Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk about some recent work that uh, we've done on uh, developing a new probe of dark matter in uh, spiral galaxies. And the idea here is to analyze disturbances in the outer gas disks, in the outer H1 disks of spirals, such as in this image that you see here. This is the H1 map of M51. And what we find is by analyzing these kind of structures, we can quantitatively characterize dark matter dominated dwarf galaxies. Namely, we can figure out how massive they are and where they are in radius and azimuth. Um, I want to emphasize that the structures that we're going to analyze are on the very outskirts of spirals. The, this is the H1 map of M83, and the lens scale here is about 100 kpc. The optical radius is here. So we're analyzing these kind of structures here that are the very edges where the effects of perturbers are predominant over the intrinsic response. So I'll first talk about the proof of principle uh, of the method by applying it to galaxies like M51 that have optically visible companions, because in these cases you can go back and check if you got the answer right. And then I'll talk about recent work that builds on this now sequence of papers to infer the distribution of dark matter in the larger primary spiral galaxy itself. And of course, uh, some of our work here is motivated by uh, discrepancies uh, that have been known between the CDM paradigm and subgalactic scales, such as the missing satellites problem, uh, as well as uh, and, uh, more uh, recent work done by uh, Michael uh, that highlights the fact that massive satellites with Vmax of order 40 kilometers per second are too dense to host uh, the known uh, bright Milky Way satellites. Now, these uh, satellites with Vmax of order 40 kilometers per second would certainly leave a visible imprint on the outer H1 disks of spirals. So you may be able to hunt for them by, by analyzing their gravitational imprints, even if they're too dim to be seen uh, from their optical light. So one of the reasons we focus on the H1 is because uh, it's the coldest component of the galaxy that is the most responsive in the gas, of course, a lot colder than the stars. The second reason is that gas has short-term memory. Okay, disturbances in the gas disk dissipate on the order of a dynamical time, leaving you a clean slate. In contrast to the stellar disk, where disturbances last for many crossing times, and this can make the interpretation of disturbances in the stellar disk a little bit more difficult to, to, to understand. And finally, as you saw, the outer H1 disks of spirals are really very extended. Okay, they go out to distances that are very large compared to the optical radius. So they present a large cross-section for interaction with these dark subhalos or dark matter dominated dwarf galaxies. So uh, I'll first talk about the proof principle of the method by uh, selecting a couple of galaxies uh, that have H1 maps from the Think survey, which produced um, uh, this was a survey that produced H1 maps of about some 40 galaxies in the local volume. And uh, I'll select a couple that have optically visible companions and have sufficient quality of data for, uh, that, to allow us to do this analysis. So M51 is a great example. Okay, this is the optical image of M51, and that's where the satellite uh, sits on the tip of the short arm. And this is the H1 map of M51, and that's where the satellite would sit. And the idea here is to basically do a set of SPH simulations of an M51-like galaxy interacting with a satellite. And we're going to try and find the best fit between the simulations to uh, the projected uh, gas surface density. And we're specifically going to focus on these large-scale structures. So we're going to analyze the low-order Fourier amplitudes of the projected gas surface density of the H1 map to find the best fit. So this is... Uh, one of the uh, best fit simulations, and before I go into details, let me just note that at the time when you have uh, an acceptable fit to the low order Fourier amplitudes, the morphology uh, of this outer H1 arm here is in very good agreement visually with what you see in the real galaxy. And I've also marked with crosses here the location of the center of the primary galaxy and the location of the uh, companion. And you can see that at the time when we have a good fit to the Fourier amplitudes, the satellite is sitting very close to the tip of the short arm as it does in the real system. Now, this is a multi-dimensional parameter space. So it's useful to have a way of visually conveying 
what parameters drive the fit to the data. And I found that a useful way of doing this is uh, on this variance versus variance plot. Okay, so what I'm plotting here is the variance of the m equal to 1 Fermi amplitude, so simulation minus data whole squared, on the x-axis, and I've summed every radius to get a, a scalar quantity. And uh, the variance of the first four modes on the y-axis, where I've added them in quadrature. Okay, now, because this is a variance versus variance plot, simulation minus data whole squared on both axes, the best fits will lie close to the origin. And the relative distance from the origin will tell you how poor the fit is. So you can see that the best fits occur for a 1 to 3 mass ratio satellite that gets within 15 kiloparsec of the galactic center, uh, of the center of M51. So the nomenclature here is the number before the R is the mass ratio of the satellite, and the number after the R is the pericentric approach distance. Now you can also immediately see that a 1 to 100 mass ratio satellite could not have produced the disturbances in the outer H1 disk of M51. Now, in addition to varying the satellite mass and pericentric approach distance, there, there are many other uh, quantities that we can vary, uh, such as the initial conditions of the primary galaxy, like the bulge fraction, the, the gas fraction, what kind of equation of state we're using, uh, what kind of star formation prescription we're using. You can also vary the orbital inclination of the satellite, as well as the you know, orbital velocity. There are many parameters that one can, uh, in fact, vary. Um, so when, what I mean by the very ends of a given case here is I'm holding the satellite mass and pericentric approach distance constant, and I'm letting everything else vary that might conceivably affect the answer, such as these parameters here. And as you can see, while these other parameters have some effect uh, on this global metric, they don't drive the fit to uh, the data. In our inference, of a 1 to 3 mass ratio satellite for M50, M51 is very close uh, to uh, what's observationally inferred. Now, <clears throat> even the best fit simulation will move around on this variance versus variance plot as a function of time, because disturbances in the gas disk dissipate on the order of a dynamical time. So it starts far off, and then for a range of times as close to here, it hovers close to the origin and then moves back off again. So this does give you a means of getting a handle on the time of encounter as well. And you can check to see how well you do on the azimuth. So I'm plotting here the fractional error in our determination of the azimuth of the satellite as a function of uh, this quantity, uh, as a function of the variance of the m equals 1 mode. And you see it's pretty well correlated with that. And we do better than 50% when we have a uh, good fit to the data. Now, M51 has a pretty massive satellite. And we wanted to check that we do, uh, we continue to do well on, on gal with galaxies with smaller satellites, and NGC 1512 gives us an opportunity to do this. So this has a 1 to 100 mass ratio satellite. And again, uh, you can check how well you do on the uh, determination of the azimuth. This is a fractional error in the azimuth as a function of the variance of the m equal to 1 mode. This is the actually now the global Fourier amplitudes, and we do very well when we have a good fit to the data. So, so you know, we believe that the method works over a very large range in perturber to primary galaxy mass ratio and allows you to quantitatively characterize dark matter dominated dwarf galaxies simply from analysis of observed disturbances in outer H1 disks without requiring any knowledge of their optical light. Um, so, um, because the hydro simulations take some time to do, we also developed a semi-analytic way of studying these disturbances, and this allowed us to come up with scaling relations between the sum of the Fourier amplitudes and the satellite mass. Okay, and as you can see, this scales very simply with the satellite mass ratio as the square root of the satellite mass. So if you believe the model holds, and that is an assumption, obviously, if you believe the disturbances are due to a external perturber, then you can simply read off the satellite mass from the observed H1 map. We did this because we wanted to uh, do the study uh, more statistically. So in principle, you could use this to zeroth order and refine with numerical calculation. So to finish with, uh, you know, I mean, we've known since the 70s um, from the observations of rotation curves. The dark matter halos exist around galaxies. 
but there are very few probes that let us get a handle on how it's distributed. So theoretical and body simulations give us some expectations. But they don't really give us a means of, say, pointing to that spiral galaxy over there and asking, how is the dark matter distributed in that specific spiral galaxy over there? Okay, so, but I'm going to start with these theoretical simulations to begin with. Okay, so uh, I'm going to start with a NFW profile for the halo where the density goes as r to the minus 1 for radii less than the scale radius and goes as r to the minus 3 for radii greater than the scale radius. And the question that I'm trying to answer here is how can we get the scale radius? How can we develop an observationally motivated probe for the scale radius of the dark matter halo for the moment within the context of the NFW profile? Okay? So this sequence of images here shows you cases where it varied the scale radius from a large uh, scale radius value, 32, to an intermediate value to a low value. And of course, the, uh, what you use for the, uh, the uh, scale radius affects your density profile, which is going to dramatically affect the uh, resultant disturbances because it affects the potential depth uh, of the halo. Now, the density goes as r the minus 1 for radii less than the scale radius, right? So if you have a very large scale radius, density is following the shallow r to the minus 1 profile all the way out to the extent of the H1 disk. If you have a low scale radius, it switches over and follows the steeper profile, okay? And steeper density profiles are more effective at holding on to their stuff, producing more tightly wrapped spiral platforms than shallow density profiles. And that's the essential transition that you see here. Now, a little bit more quantitatively, uh, you can express what you, what you just saw in terms of the phase of the modes, which tells you how the spiral is wrapped. Is it, very, is it wrapped very loosely, or is it wrapped very tightly? Okay, so now I'm showing the phase of the m equal to 1 mode, which is the dominant mode that you saw for M51. Okay, for the large scale radius case, the low scale radius case, and the intermediate scale radius case. And I've overplotted here the phase of the m equals 1 mode of the data, which happens to agree most closely with the uh, intermediate scale radius case. Now you can understand this a little bit more physically by plotting the phase of the m equals 1 mode as a function of a dimensionless radius. Okay? And you can see that the phase has a negative gradient interior to the scale radius. It has a positive gradient exterior to the scale radius, and it transitions close to the scale radius. So if you can construct H1 maps and do this sort of analysis for galaxies in the local volume, you can develop an observationally motivated probe for the scale radius of individual spiral galaxies. And uh, you know, I think within the lo local volume, there really aren't any other probes uh, to do this. And it's a bit of a technical point. Um, we also wanted to uh, check that uh, the uh, inference of the scale radius was robust to varying the concentration parameter, and that's what I'm doing here. I'm varying uh, R200 here within, uh, for the NFW model, and as you can see, there isn't very much of a dependence in the outer regions. Uh, there is some dependence in the inner regions because the size of the disk is set by uh, the concentration parameter in these models. You can also check um, if this metric depends on the uh, initial conditions, like the bulge fraction, gas fraction, et cetera, and as well as uh, you know, vary the satellite mass and person approach distance to the range that would still allow you to get a good fit to the Fourier amplitudes. Um, and while there is some dependence on these uh, parameters, the dependence isn't so large that you can't tell the difference between a large scale radius, an intermediate scale radius, and a low scale radius. Interestingly, uh, the uh, 17 kiloparsec scale radius is what you expect from dissipationless simulations for uh, virial masses of order 10 to the 12. So let me um, talk about um, some recent work that we've been doing. Uh, this is with Victor De Batista and Leo uh, Blitz, which is, you know, will halo shapes affect our analysis? Will they serve as uh, a false positive in the sense of, you know, will they mimic the kind of structures that um, satellites produce on, on outer H1 disks? I think in general the answer is, of course, yes. But disturbances in, in, in systems of, like M51 are clearly uh, dominated by the, the uh, companion. Um, 
And partly, I think the, the, this question comes up because cosmological dissipation with cosmological simulations produce triaxial halos. However, it's also known that when you include a baryonic component, you do get rounder halos over time, and we see this uh, in these simulations when we include gas cooling. These are the shape parameters um, from early times when it, you know, is, is clearly not very round, moving up to uh, later times close to present day, uh, and the halo does become rounder as the gas transfers its angular momentum, okay, as this component that has an abundance of angular momentum gives it away to the stuff that has less. So uh, now these are, this is uh, what the gas distribution looks like at early times and uh, at late times, and you can see, you know, it is becoming rounder uh, over time. And if you were to look at the Fourier amplitudes of the planar disturbances close to present day, when gas cooling has become effective, you would see that uh, this is less than 10%, okay, close to present day, okay, that is, torques from non-spherical halos are not sufficient to produce large planar disturbances. However, a warp does survive in some of these simulations where the gas and halo angular momenta are misaligned. Okay. And again, all of this is in the absence of perturbers. And I want to emphasize, it's, it, it's not showing up too clear here, but there is a very uh, strong warp in, in, in this simulation. And it survives till present day. And I want to emphasize this point because I think these two things tend to get conflated. Um, and the warp and planar disturbances can, in principle, and I think do arise due to very distinct mechanisms. You can have a warp in the absence of a satellite, but it appears from this preliminary analysis that uh, non-spherical, torques from non-spherical halos do not mimic the uh, effects of satellites. And we're also looking into um, extending this work to um, develop scaling relations for multiple satellites, and we're interested in actually doing a comparison with gravitational lensing, both uh, with cosmological hydro simulations and, um, and with, with observations. Now, just this is my attempt at a fa family portrait, so to speak. Um, so I've got redshift here on this axis and number on this axis, okay? So our method, so far, we really applied it to the local volume, right? Okay, so very low redshift. And typically, gravitational lensing, traditionally, it's really been more of a high redshift probe of dark matter. Um, and with weak lensing, with galaxy galaxy weak lensing, you can uh, uh, characterize uh, the structure in the outskirts also by stacking uh, tens of thousands of galaxies. Um, and, you know, we've, we, just as strong lensing, we've focused on individual spiral galaxies. We can both characterize substructure as well as uh, constrain parameters of the dark matter halo. And uh, right now, we're looking into trying to get H1 data of a low redshift sample of spirals to uh, compare this method to uh, strong gravitational lensing. So let me go ahead and summarize. I find that analysis of perturbations in the cold gas on the outskirts of galaxies allows us to constrain uh, the mass and location of uh, satellites, whether they're dark or luminous. So this is essentially a new method to render dark galaxies visible. Um, we've tested this method uh, by applying it to galaxies with absolutely visible companions that span a large range in perturbed to primary galaxy mass ratio. And most recently, uh, I've extended this to infer the dark matter density profile in spiral galaxies, specifically to constrain the scale radius. And uh, we're looking into developing a more comprehensive model by looking at the effects of halo shapes, as well as the effects of multiple satellites. And I'm particularly interested in um, comparing this to gravitational uh, lensing. So if, if that's of interest uh, to anyone in the audience, please uh, come and talk to me. And I'll also mention uh, that coming soon to a theater near you, uh, we will have a uh, conference. This is a, one of these new AAS topical conference series meetings uh, on probes of dark matter on galaxy scales. This is going to be next summer. The idea is to bring together people who are working on different probes of dark matter from gravitational lensing to dynamics to indirect probes like uh, gamma ray annihilation signals. Thanks a lot for your attention.